Okay, everybody, this video is going to be about the idea of why cells have to be so small. We all know that cells are microscopic, and this is from the level two book, section 10-1, and this tries to explain why cells have to be so small. So we're gonna to try to answer that question today. All right, so let's get started. Okay. A multicellular organism like you and me and plants and fungus and all these other things, everything starts out small. And you guys remember from our study of the characteristics of living things, one of the characteristics to be considered a living thing is that that thing grows and develops. Well, as a multicellular organism grows and develops, it makes more and more cells, and that's what allows it to become bigger. So when we were all born, we were all probably between five and 10 pounds. Some may have been smaller, some may have been bigger. And now we're all bigger than five or 10 pounds. And the reason why is, is that we have been forming more and more cells, okay? It's not that our individual cells just got bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? That is not what happens. So in order to experience growth, we form more and more cells and our individual cells all stay the same size. So uh, the cells in a baby are the same size as your cells. You just have more of those cells, okay? So from this slide, write down this one, and you can skip that bottom one. Now remember, I might be going a little fast, so feel free to pause the video uh, so that you can kind of keep up and, and catch up if you need to. Okay, there are two main reasons why you make more cells to grow larger and why you don't, your individual cells just don't become bigger and bigger and bigger. The first reason given by your textbook is called the availability of DNA. Okay, I'll just, I'm gonna give you a few factual statements here and then kind of have like the concluding statement at the bottom. And you'll need to write all of this. So, you guys realize from studying cells that certain organelles need access to the information, need access to our DNA. And you guys know that because you know that ribosomes use the DNA's information to make a, a simple protein, which then goes to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which then goes to the Golgi apparatus, and then becomes a finished protein. So ribosomes are a great example of organelles that need to access the genes in the nucleus. In our nucleus, there's only one copy of DNA. Okay, there's not multiple copies. There's not all these different nuclei all over the cell. There's one nucleus with one copy of DNA within it. Logically, a large cell would have to have more organelles because it would need to have more mitochondria to make more energy, maybe more chloroplast to make more sugar. Um, it would need more proteins to function, so it would need more of those ribosomes and more rough ERs and smooth ERs and lysosomes, so that makes sense. Your textbook puts it like this. If a cell were just to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it would have more and more and more organelles, which would all be trying to put more demands on that DNA. Well, that wouldn't work, okay, because what would happen is some organelles would need access to the, to the DNA, the DNA would be unavailable because it'd be being accessed by other organelles at that same exact time, and certain organelles would not be able to get the DNA's information. Uh, guys, that doesn't work. When proteins need to be made, they need to be made right then. When enzymes need to be made, they need to be made right then. Okay, there's no such thing for a healthy cell to say, you know, oh, we need this enzyme, but, you know, we're kind of backed up right now. That's going to take about 10 minutes. That's not an option for cells. Okay, a cell would die if that were to happen. So your book calls it an information crisis would occur, basically meaning that certain organelles would need access to the, to the DNA and they wouldn't be able to get it. Okay, so uh, from this slide, you really do need everything. Okay. The second reason uh, is the reason we're gonna focus on and it's called material exchange. You all know that cells need to move certain materials in. They do that through their cell membrane, and they need oxygen, um, a glucose, nitrogen, phosphorus, compounds, sodium, potassium, water. You also know that cells need to move things out of themselves. 
Okay, carbon dioxide, waste products that would become toxic if they were if they were to accumulate. Uh, water may need to move out of cells at times, and you guys also know. So I don't think you guys need to write this. I think you can skip this because we spent a lot of time talking about this. How do materials move into and out of a cell? You all know passive and active transport. You guys be the judge if you need this. I think you know this, but if not, take a minute and jot it down. So you know that there's diffusion, osmosis facilitated diffusion. That's one way to move, some ways to move materials into and out of a cell without using the cell's energy. Then there's endocytosis, exocytosis, and those membrane uh, pumps, those are our active transport. Now, those are slow processes. Think about how slowly diffusion happens. If you were to stand at one side of your bedroom and spray air freshener in the corner and someone else is in the other corner, it would probably take a minute for it to get across to them so they could smell it. Well, I mean, you could walk that distance in about three seconds. So if you had to walk around at the speed of diffusion, you'd be extremely slow. It'd be like slower than a turtle walking around. Okay. So compared to how we get around, those are very slow processes. Slow processes are very good at moving things over short distances. Think about walking. Walking is very good at moving you over distances probably less than a mile or two. Any more than that, you're probably going to want to ride in a car. So let me say that again. Slow movement processes are very efficient over short distances. Over long distances, they're, they're too slow to be realistic. Okay, so, you know, we already wrote these are slow processes. And what I'm saying is a large cell that's, you know, it would be still reliant on the passive and active transport because it's reliant on these slow processes, it wouldn't be able to exchange materials with the surrounding environment fast enough to survive. Okay, so let's say a cell was this big, actual size. Okay. And it needs oxygen, so there's all this oxygen outside of it. Let's say the middle of the cell has mitochondria, which it probably would. To go this distance, which is what, like an inch? For oxygen to diffuse in that one inch from all sides to reach those mitochondria in the middle. Remember, you're not going through air. Diffusion happens faster through air. You're going through cytoplasm, which is sort of like a aloe gel or a hair gel sort of consistency. Guys, this would take minutes to cross this one inch. Cells don't have minutes. If those mitochondria don't get oxygen when they need it, you guys know they don't make ATP, the cell's going to die. So because passive and active transport are so slow, materials can't make it across large distances. That's why cells have to stay microscopic so that those distances from the cell membrane to the middle of the cell are very small. Okay? So guys, take a minute to note um, at the very least the bottom one. And I think you do need to note that passive and active transport are slow processes. Okay, the next slide is a conclusion that kind of wraps everything up. Uh, just kind of read through the logic with me. And I think you've written down everything that's important. So what we've been saying is, as a multicellular organism grows and develops, it actually makes more cells. Okay, your individual cells do not just get enormous. Uh, a creature that's unicellular, one cell big, like me, like a bacterial cell, it gets to a certain size and then stops growing. Okay, that's why bacteria stay microscopic. Uh, and we'll talk about, in about another week, how cells know what that size is. Okay, what, what dictates to them get to this size and stop? Okay. Uh, one reason was access to DNA, okay, and we talked about that. The second reason is that active and passive transport are slow, and that's going to limit how big cells can get. And then we already said this statement, okay, so you guys don't really need any of this stuff because you wrote all this down. And I do need to write down this bottom one, and this can go right underneath where you left off on the previous slide. Cells must have what we call a large surface area to volume ratio in order to exchange materials quickly enough. And we're going to look at what that means on the next slide. Okay, 
So cells must have a large surface area and a small volume in order for these slow processes like diffusion, osmosis, uh, endocytosis, whichever one you want to think about, in order for those processes to exchange materials quickly enough with the outside. Okay, so we got to talk about this idea of surface area to volume ratio. We're going to do a little bit of math, okay? Surface area is basically how much wrapping paper you would need to wrap a present, okay? So it's the amount of area to completely cover the outside of a surface. And I guess more mathematically, I have a little more formal definition for you. The sum of all the surface areas of the sides of an object. And you can calculate this for a cylinder, for a sphere, for a cube, rectangle. I'm sure you've done this in math classes before. Volume is how much space uh, an object takes up. And you guys did this freshman year when you talked about density is mass over volume and you had to figure out volumes of objects and all of it probably may given the volume of objects to figure all that out. We're going to take a look at cubes as our example. Right, you all know a cube is a box with a length, width, and height are all the same. So the volume of a cube, it's real easy. We're going to do length times width times height. The surface area, we're going to take the area of one surface, which is length times width. And because it's a cube, all the sides are the exact same size. And there are six sides. Because think about there's a front and a back, a left and a right, and a top and a bottom. So there are six equal areas, and that's how we'll get the surface area of a cube. So guys, I'm going to make a little chart here, and we're going to calculate some of these things. So let's do... Um, here we'll have our cube size, then we'll have surface area, then we'll have volume, and then here we're going to have surface area to volume ratio. We'll calculate a few cubes just so you guys see how this is done. We'll do a cube, whoops, what did I do? There we go. We'll do a cube that's one centimeter by one centimeter long by one centimeter high. We'll do one that's two centimeters wide by two centimeters long by two centimeters high. We'll do one that's three centimeters by three centimeters by three centimeters. And then we'll do a really small one. One that's 0 0.01 centimeters by 0 0.01 centimeters by 0 0.01 centimeters. Okay, so the one by one by one, you guys know that math would be one times one equals one, and then multiply that by six sides, that's six centimeters squared. Okay, volume of that is one times one times one, what you guys know is one, and that's cubic centimeters because you had three sides so that's why there's a three it's cubic surface area is six volume is one so we have a six to one surface area to volume ratio and a one to one to one cube in a two by two by two we do two times two do you guys know is four multiply that by six and our surface area is 24 square centimeters so we'll write that down here our 2 by 2 by 2 volume is length times width times height, which is 2 times 2 is 4, times another 2 is 8, and that's centimeters cubed. Okay, so that's 24 to 8 ratio, which you all know reduces down to a 4 to 1 surface area to volume ratio. Our 3 by 3 by 3, 3 times 3 is 9 times 6 is 54, so that's 54 centimeters squared. And then for our volume, it's 3 times 3, which is 9, times another 3 is 27. Now if you reduce that down, that 54 to 27, that is a 2 to 1, and I'm just realizing this is 3 to 1. Okay, so you can see as our cube gets bigger, 
our surface area to volume gets smaller. Okay, so it's sort of an inverse relationship. Okay, now for our next one, um, we have 0 0.01 by 0 0.01 by 0 0.01, and I cheated a little bit. I know what this answer is. So we have 0 0.01 times 0 0.01, and we're going to multiply that by 6, and that will give us our surface area. And then for our volume, we're going to do 0 0.01 times 0 0.01 times 0 0.01, and that'll give us our volume. Okay, um, I don't have a calculator right in front of me here, but if you were to do this and plug it in right here for the surface area, and then if you were to do this math for the volume and plug it in right here, and then do our ratio, this ends up being 600 to 1. So guys, this is a tiny cube. And look how large our surface area is. We have 600 units of surface area for every one unit of volume. That's exactly what a cell wants to have. Tons of area touching the surface and a skinny little volume. Okay, so let's just write one conclusion statement here. And then we can, we can be all finished with this. Okay, so cells need to have a large surface area and a small volume to efficiently exchange materials, you know, with the environment. And we call that a large surface area to volume ratio. That's what all this math is proving to you. Cells need to stay way down here on the small end of things so that this surface area to volume ratio stays big. Okay? If you're a visual person like me, I would say think of a pancake. That is a great example of a cell, because think about a pancake from the side. It is super skinny, so super small volume. And look at all the parts that touch the pan. All of this is surface area because it was able to touch the pan. Okay, so if oxygen needs to get in, it comes in from all these surfaces into this tiny little volume. It can get there in no time. So a pancake is a great visual on how cells need to maintain a large surface where they're touching their outside, but a small little volume so things can get in and out of that volume very quickly. Okay, so guys, again, rewind. Do what you need to do to get these notes down. Write down some questions for me if anything seems confusing. And we'll keep working with stuff with this stuff as we as we keep learning here.